Welcome everyone to this fourth and final webinar to support our methods, processes and topic selection consultation for health technology evaluation at NICE. My name is Meindert Boysen. I'm the director for the health technology evaluation programs at NICE and I'll be chairing this session. I will, join, I will be joined later by an excellent team of experts from NICE, Sheila Ubadjaya, Ian Watson and Richard Diaz. Together, we'll be discussing the proposals we're making to support your understanding of the consultation and answer any questions you may have. Please note that because of the complexity of the topic being covered today, the presentation part of the webinar will take more time than usual, leaving less time for questions and answers at the end. As usual though, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available along with previous webinars on the NiceCom's YouTube channel. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the team that has made these webinars possible for their hard work over the last weeks. NICE plays a critical role in the United Kingdom. Our work is vital to ensure rapid access to clinically and cost-effective health technologies to benefit patients the NHS and the life sciences. Evolving and improving our methods and processes ensures that we adapt to emerging changes in healthcare and in health technologies. I think the slides are not uh, jumping on the screen. <laughs> I'll continue anyway, because we don't have that much time, but you'll, you'll, see, the, you'll see the slide in, a slide in a minute. Our overarching goal is to improve the health of people using the NHS and the social care systems. And of course, in doing so, we support equitable access for people using those services. You'll find, if you've read our proposals, that there's a real clear benefit for patients uh, uh, through, through what we propose, such as prompt access to innovative health technologies and easier ways to contribute to the work we do. In the same way, for people working in the life sciences, they'll find a responsive, flexible, and predictable way of working with us. And they, of course, will also see flexibility when the evidence they're producing is difficult to interpret and to analyze. We recognize that through our proposals. And finally, for the NHS, these proposals will ensure a fair, equitable, and evidence-based access to innovations. And of course, in the end, as it is important for our role, it should lead to technologies that are clinically effective. The adoption of those technologies and value for money will be supported through our proposals. I'm confident that these changes to the methods will support the ambition laid out by the Prime Minister in his life sciences vision, which was to make the UK the best place to discover develop, test, trial, and launch, and in the end, adopt new technologies. Now, today's webinar will be specifically talking about modifiers. Most of you will be familiar with the terms methods and modifiers in the context of health technology evaluation. But for those of you that are not so familiar with it, methods are the principles for health technology evaluation assessment and appraisal, as we tend to call it, within NICE, but also across other organizations that do the same job. The methods present the concepts which underpin each stage of evaluation, and they explain what evidence is required for decision-making. They're really important to ensure consistent decision-making and trust in the guidance we produce. Now, modifiers are factors that can influence or potentially change the decision or recommendations that our independent committees make, and they can be qualitative or quantitatively expressed. In the next few slides, Ian Watson and Richard Diaz will expand on how the methods and specifically the modifiers are being used within our, uh, in our, in our, in our work and how they're changing in a way that is supported by the best available evidence. In the end, these changes should reflect what society values and should represent a fair and equitable way 
of making decisions in the NHS. After the presentation by Ian and Richard, we'll be coming back to you for the questions and answers. Over to you. Yes, thank you, Minder. So as, uh, as you mentioned, Richard and I will be focusing uh, in further on some of the modifiers that were being considered in the current consultation. So uh, as, as you heard, modifiers are those factors that uh, our committees think about when, when appropriate, when, we're, when they're thinking about the clinical benefit and value for money of a, of a treatment or a diagnostic or a, a medical device. And they influence or they change how we think about the evidence, the clinical benefits, the value for money, or, or they can influence or change how we reach a conclusion or make a recommendation. Um, as mentioned, they can be either qualitative or quantitative. And what that means is that a quantitative modifier is one that can be expressed in, in numerical terms as a number or a value, whereas a qualitative modifier would be one that's more a deliberative approach, where the committee would discuss it and, and, and explore it as part of the decision as a whole. I think the important thing to remember is that um, whenever we uh, apply a modifier such that we give extra weight or uh, extra benefit to a particular technology, such as allowing a higher cost effectiveness um, estimate, that leads to a displacement elsewhere in the health system. So it impacts on the other treatments elsewhere in the NHS, because the NHS doesn't have uh, an infinite amount of resources. Every time we recommend a new uh, treatment, uh, the, the money that's spent on that can't be used again. Um, so, um, that's true of all recommendations, but it's particularly true when modifiers are applied to give extra weight because the impact of that treatment becomes greater. There's a greater effect of displacement. And that means we must apply modifiers cautiously uh, and we consider they should be applied in exceptional circumstances. So normally consider that uh, the benefits or health effects of a technology are valued the same whenever or whoever they arise to. Um, so that, but we consider that modifiers then are applied as an exception. The aim of using a modifier is to acknowledge uh, extra value that society uh, places on the type of health gained from the, the treatment or health technology that's being evaluated. I think we might have, um, sorry, I carry on. Um, Firstly, just to say that our committees can take into account any of the relevant considerations for a, for, a, for a given evaluation, but there are some specific considerations or modifiers that we explicitly ask the committee to, um, to consider within our current methods. And those are illustrated on this slide here down the left-hand side. Um, but to focus on two of these in particular within our current methods, many of you will be familiar with the um, modifier that we term end of life or or consider for treatments that uh, extend life or life extending treatments that are uh, for conditions that are near the end of people's lives. And that's what we would refer to as a quantitative modifier because that allows uh, for extra weighting to be applied to health benefits of up to 1.7 times, which is that's similar to saying that a, a treatment could be recommended with cost effectiveness levels up to 50,000 pounds per quality gained. And that means that in this case, we're placing more value on, uh, on health gains generated by treatments that benefit people at the end of their lives. Uh, another modifier to, to focus on is that of uncertainty. And this, this refers to the fact that committees should be more cautious about recommending uh, a treatment when the evidence is less certain. And the reason we say that is because uncertain evidence means that people could be put at risk. Uh, that could be either the people having the treatment or other people whose care might be displaced by the, by the new treatment. So those are, the, uh, are two of those um, uh, key modifiers. In the case of uncertainty in practice, we know that that's uh, a complicated area and it needs a very nuanced discussion. This is particularly the case when evidence generation is difficult, uh, which, as we'll explore later. At the first stage of the methods review, we explored in particular detail three uh, modifiers. Um, and at that stage, we were aiming to determine what should change in NICE's methods. Whereas in this stage, we're moving on to how these changes should be implemented. 
So of those three, the first is uh, that of severity, which we're going to explore in, in, in some more detail in the coming slides. But just to explain the, the case for change that we established at the, the first stage was that really there was somewhat limited evidence that society does place additional value on end of life treatments as we described them. But on the flip side, there was, there was greater evidence that society places value on health benefits for very severe conditions. And that led to uh, a case to be made for removing the end of life modifier that we have and adding one that considers uh, the, the severity of a disease. The second of the, of the three uh, is around health inequalities. And the, again, the review identified evidence that uh, society or the, 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 the UK population has an important priority for a fair distribution of health across society. Indeed, uh, there was evidence that um, we, we as a society may be willing to generate less health overall in order to make sure that disadvantaged groups who would otherwise not access so much uh, health or health care uh, would, would, um, would gain benefits. And therefore, we established, again, a case for change uh, for, for, the modif for a modifier here uh, to introduce one that in considers health inequalities. Uh, and thirdly, uncertainty, I talked about that on the previous slide, that we have uh, a modifier here for, un for uncertainty, but we identified a, a case for change to clarify the circumstances uh, and confirm those circumstances where committees can apply flexibilities uh, and considering greater uncertainty when evidence generation is particularly difficult. Uh, we consulted on those cases for change and the responses we received were largely supportive. Uh, although that did depend on, in, in stakeholders' view, on how those modifiers would be developed at this next stage. So the task for this stage then is to develop proposals for how we can introduce these uh, and implement these modifiers and these proposals in practice. Starting with health inequalities, as I said before, this is a, um, this is a really important area for NICE, a really high priority uh, for NICE. But as we moved through the process of developing uh, and exploring how we could implement uh, a, a modifier for health inequalities. Uh, it be became uh, extremely apparent how broad and complex an area this is that impacts across all of NICE. Uh, and it's described in our NICE principles and in the NICE strategy. Um, and there's ongoing work also outside of the current methods review and it's uh, crucial that we then get this um, modifier right and it, that it works across all of NICE in a way that is fair and consistent and, and relevant across all the different aspects of NICE's work. So while our existing methods for health technology evaluation do allow for committees to take into account relevant considerations that they see in individual evaluations if they are right, we still think there is a case to uh, consider a formal modifier for health inequalities, but knowing that there is this further work that we need to do to uh, resolve the, the specific challenges that are, um, impact across NICE. And therefore, um, we propose that, as I say, there is a case to introduce a formal health inequalities modifier, but we need to work towards resolving those challenges um, in, order to, in order to do that. Um, for completeness, it's worth just quickly emphasizing here that when we talk about health inequalities here, this is separate from a wider consideration of equalities within NICE's legal and moral, moral duties to eliminate un unlawful discrimination and promote equality. So those equalities consideration remain, as always, a, a vital and integral part of, of health technology evaluations and continue to be considered by committees as we develop the further work around health inequalities. Thinking then about uncertainty, I think it, it, it's worth emphasizing that although there is a case for clarifying our methods here, we retain um, some of the crucial parts of uh, the existing modifier. So firstly, that committees should be more cautious about recommending technologies when the evidence is uncertain for those reasons that I, that I outlined before. And we do, we do emphasize the need for a higher standard of evidence whenever possible. Um, there's other mechanisms that can be used to resolve and address uncertainty, such as um, research programs and data collection. And this is, many of you will be familiar with developments around uh, Cancer Drugs Fund and Innovative Medicines. Um, 
so those those mechanisms are available um, but it's also important that we clarify our um, our methods with regard to uncertainty um, where where evidence generation is difficult and this is described in our proposals that we um, allow committees or confirm that we allow committees to accept a higher degree of uncertainty in specific circumstances particularly uh, for example rare diseases technologies indicated for children and innovative and in complex treatments to focus then on severity this is um, perhaps one of the 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 key modifiers that I want to spend a little bit more time, a little, little bit more time on, a little bit more detail on. Um, as I said, we, we identified the case, case for change to introduce the severity modifier, but in order to do that, there's really three key considerations. So the firstly, well, how do you measure severity? If we want to apply a severity modifier, we need to consider how we measure it. Secondly, what are the underlying principles for the modifier that we want to establish. And then thirdly, for building on those first two questions, how do we go about designing and implementing it in practice? So how do you measure severity? Well, at the first stage of the methods review, we explored a number of, uh, of, of options um, and another uh, number of different methods. And the one we um, have moved towards is that of quality shortfall. And I'd like to explain a little bit more about quality shortfall here. So as I say, in order to apply a severity modifier, we need to first measure how severe a particular condition is. And in order to do that, we need to do it um, properly. We need to do it fairly and consistently across different conditions. We need to take into account all sorts of different aspects of disease. And in, it's in that context that we propose to use the concept of quality shortfall. So the concept of quality shortfall may be familiar to a number of people. It has been explored before, for example, in uh, the value-based assessment discussions here at NICE and also in some other agencies in other countries. And we're now proposing to use this concept here. Uh, and I'd like to explain a bit more why we think it's the right thing to do. So we can perhaps think of uh, severity as the amount of health that a person loses or misses out on because of that condition. Um, in order to measure how much health a person loses, we can use qualities or quality adjusted life years. Many of you will be familiar with uh, qualities, but uh, for others, just to remind you, qualities are a way of measuring health across different diseases and conditions. And that takes into account both how, lo how long people live uh, and also their quality of life. So we can use uh, qualities, and we routinely use qualities as a way to measure um, health benefits from a treatment. So we look at the gain in qualities. And by that same token, we can also think about the amount of qualities lost as a measure of how a severe uh, condition is. That is how much health is lost because of that condition. So the number of qualities lost because of a condition then is called the quality shortfall. And it's quality shortfall that we propose to use as a measure of severity for this severity modifier. So if we think about the severity of a condition as the amount of health lost because of it, that is the, the shortfall, we can see that a condition might cause a quality shortfall because it shortens the person's life or it reduces their quality of life or both. And that's really relevant here. Um, there's two ways to, to calculate quality shortfall. So you can think calculate it in either absolute terms or proportional terms. Again, referred to as absolute and proportional shortfall. Each of those uh, shows a different aspect of a severe, severe disease. And therefore we propose to use both to build up a full picture of how severe a condition is. So the absolute shortfall is the total amount of health that's lost because of the condition. Whereas the proportional shortfall is the fraction of the remaining health that's lost. So a condition might be severe if it causes a person to lose a large amount of health in total, or if it causes them to lose a large fraction or proportion of their remaining health. In both cases, um, we think about the amount of health lost with the condition by taking into account currently available treatments. And that means that through this absolute and proportional shortfall measures, we can take into account how severe the conditions, but also thinking about any unmet needs that a condition has or people with a condition have. So let's look at this again with some illustrations. 
So on this slide, uh, we see a, a severe condition, such as a, a long-term chronic condition. So this is a hypothetical condition, just for illustration. This is not a real one, but hopefully it illustrates the points that we are, are, are showing. So the lower area in, in the darker teal color is the health someone would expect to have if they had the condition. Uh, whereas the upper area, the, the lighter purpley color, is the health that you would expect if you didn't have the condition. So you can see that the condition causes both a lower quality of life and also a slightly reduced life expectancy, meaning that the total amount of health that someone with this condition is reduced compared to someone without the condition. In fact, in this case, by quite a long way. So the difference in between the total amount of health uh, without the condition or with the condition, that is the absolute shortfall, is large. Uh, so in this, in this made up example, that, so you can see that the health without the condition uh, is uh, 25 qualities, whereas with the condition it's five qualities, giving an absolute shortfall, absolute quality shortfall uh, of 20 qualities. So we can firmly say that this hypothetical condition is very severe. On this slide, again, a, a hypothetical uh, made up example. This is perhaps an example of uh, something like a, a fatal condition in later life. Again, the, the area in purple and in teal show the health without the condition and with the condition. And in this case, the total amount of health that's lost is rather smaller than the previous uh, example. So that, that's it. That means that the absolute shortfall is, is a little lower. But the fraction or the proportion of the remaining health that's lost is very large. So actually, you can see here that this condition is causing people to miss out on most of their remaining health. So, the, so here, if you, people without the condition would have five qualities, people with the condition would have half a quality, giving an absolute shortfall of four and a half. So that's, as I say, rather less. So that, that doesn't necessarily imply it's uh, severe, it's quite so severe, but the fraction or the proportion is much larger. It's around 0.9 or and people are losing 90% of their, their remaining health. So this condition is severe because it has a very large proportional shortfall. So hopefully those uh, examples illustrate how, um, how, how qualities and quality shortfall could work to establish a full picture of severity covering a wide range of different types of conditions. And now my colleague Richard will go into detail on how the principles we set out for the severity modifier uh, and how it will be developed into a, a proposed modifier in the next stage of the methods review. Thank you, Ian. To begin with, we started by laying out what principles should be adhered to for the severity modifier. First, we started with the principle that health benefits are of equal value across type, all types of diseases and treatments, as Ian said earlier, apart from in very exceptional circumstances. Next, we should take into account the cost and benefits of recommending a health technology in the context of health displaced elsewhere in the NHS by additional spending. Uh, the next was that the modifier would be expected to be used in a similar way to end of life. And finally, the other important issue was to spread the quality weighting to a broader range of topics and reflect a, a spectrum of severity using two levels to acknowledge that within those diseases that are considered severe is a gradient where there are, the majority of them are, are severe, but there are a small number of them that are extremely severe. Also, this is an important from a practical point uh, because a great, if we apply a gradient as a modifier, it would have been difficult to implement for practical purposes. So a, a two level modifier simplifies things a bit in terms of practicality. Importantly, we aimed to apply the modifier at an overall size equivalent to end of life. That is looking back on previous appraisals and calculating how much additional weight was given to all of end of life topics, but shifting it and spreading it across all the topics so that, um, that, that would be captured with the, the new severity modifier. The, the principle was key because it avoids increasing the displacement and opportunity costs um, so that the impact is the same on the NHS as end of life was. And it also maintains the exceptionality that's so important. 
Before we move on to how the severity modifier was developed, a word on displacement and on the magnitude of additional weighting that should be given to severity. At the moment, there is limited evidence on the opportunity cost trade-off that society is willing to accept by placing a high weight on severe conditions. We don't have the research available to define the magnitude or overall size that that additional weighting should be in the context of the NHS or how much of an impact that additional weighting would have across the NHS. Therefore, we're keen to conduct the research necessary to inform the degree to which society favors severe diseases, considering the health benefits that might be placed, displaced as a consequence and the quality weightings that should be applied for severity. This research could inform future modular updates to NICE's methods. But for now, without this evidence, it made sense to use the additional weight applied across end of life topics as the basis for the weight for, uh, which is used in the severity modifier proposed. So how did we develop the severity modifier? We began with the principles mentioned before. In particular, we focused on exceptionality as the principle where a small number of treatments for the most severe diseases gets the highest weighting and a slightly larger number of treatments gets a medium severity weighting, but the majority of topics do not um, as, as seen in the pyramid on the left-hand side of the screen. Next, we calculated the absolute and proportional shortfall for all topics between 2011 and 2019. This can be seen on the right-hand side of the screen and the horizontal axis is the absolute shortfall while the vertical is the proportional shortfall. As mentioned before, absolute shortfall is measured in qualities lost from disease and proportional shortfall is a fraction. Um, so that number will be, be between zero and one. When we place the previous topics on the graph, this gray area that you see was the general distribution of the treatments evaluated. Uh, unfortunately, we can't show you the specific points due to confidentiality, but, uh, but uh, within these topics, we also looked at a variety of categories, including whether treatments were for children's diseases or whether they had been given end of life waiting or for orphan medicines, that is treatments for rare diseases or ATMPs, um, otherwise known as advanced therapeutic medicinal products, which are defined as cell and gene therapies. So keeping the idea of exceptionality in mind, we chose these two steps as the modifier where the proportion of topics would be such that a small number of topics would get the high level modifier while a larger group gets the medium level modifier and the largest group gets no additional weighting. As you can see, a significant proportion of the topic areas presented fall within the severity levels we have set out. Medium severity is defined as an absolute quality shortfall of between 12 and 18, or a proportional short quality shortfall between 0.85 and 0.95. And the high severity level is defined as an absolute quality shortfall above 18 or a proportional quality shortfall above 0.95. For any topic being considered, an absolute quality shortfall and a proportional quality shortfall will be calculated, and the higher of the two will be used to determine which severity level is applied. On the next slide, we present the options proposed in the consultation. As we mentioned before, one of the principles was to spread the additional weight that was given to end of life topics across treatments um, so that severity weighting, um, so, so the, the treatments that would get a severity weighting rather. In option one, we keep the weight used for end of life uh, for the highest severity, so 1.7 which is used, uh, which is similar to saying that treatments can be recommended uh, up to about 50,000 pounds per quality gained. And for the medium severity level, we apply a weighting of 1.2, which is similar to saying that treatments can be recommended up to a, a, um, a range of 35,000 pounds per quality gained. So no additional weighting means that the usual levels within which 
uh, the committees can recommend a treatment as being cost effective apply. Option two differs from option one in that it narrows the difference between the medium and the high severity levels. So for the medium severity category, um, we apply a weight of 1.25, uh, which would be given, um, which translates to roughly about 37,500 uh, 37, uh, 37, uh, per quality, uh, whereas um, it, to achieve this, though, we needed to reduce the weight applied to the high severity topics uh, from 1.7 to 1.5, which translates to roughly 45,000 per quality. Uh, and remember, there are more topics in the medium category, so small changes in that group have a lot larger impact on the mean weight per appraisal, which is why the medium weight increases from 1.2 to 1.25, while the higher weight changes from 1.7 to 1.5. And we acknowledge that these, um, these are two of, of, of many ways that we can achieve this, um, to, to achieve the same average quality weighting. But these were the two options that brought us as close as possible to the mean uh, weight per appraisal that we saw with end of life. As you can see in the bottom row, the mean weights per appraisal are all very close, which was exactly the intention. So what is the impact of these changes? Overall, we anticipate that the impact will be a positive one, uh, which supports innovation overall for treatments with the most severe diseases over a broad range of conditions. This will of course depend on the line of treatment and the availability of, uh, and efficacy of current treatments within, within the NHS at the time. Uh, a severity modifier is likely to apply additional weight for those severe diseases where there are currently limited treatment options. Where before end of life mainly was applied to cancer treatments, severity now will expand the availability of a modifier to other types of diseases. So it encompasses the majority of end of life cancer treatments plus more cancers, probably at earlier stages of treatment. And non-cancer diseases such as severe epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, and severe genetic disorders. Additionally, the modifier provides clarity on value, on the value that's attributable to the new treatment, allowing for early company and stakeholder engagement. Finally, how are the modifiers we have discussed being applied in each program within the Center for Health Technology Evaluation? So for technology appraisals, the modifiers presented will be applied as directly described. Uh, for medical technologies evaluated through, through the MedTech evaluation program, uh, which uses the cost saving decision rule, the concepts of quantitative quality weight or qualitative modifiers that allow a higher ICER are not applicable. Nevertheless, it's appropriate that the committee can take into account relevant factors in its deliberations in line with societal values. Therefore, the modifiers described are not applicable as quality weights, but should be considered deliberatively within decision making. It may not be necessary to quantify severity using absolute and proportional shortfall for medical technologies. For diagnostics, the uncertainty consideration is relevant, so is applied as described and will be considered proportionately for the context of diagno diagnostic technologies. We anticipate that the severity modifier will not normally be, be applicable in diagnostic situations, and further work is needed to explore elements of value that are relevant to diagnostics, and this work can be explored in modular updates, uh, potentially combined with genomics. Finally, highly specialized technology evaluations are built on a different ethical and normative principle uh, and so uses a different decision and modifier framework based on different costs per quality level and which takes into account the magnitude of benefit associated with technology. And therefore the um, current modifiers presented would not apply. This concludes our presentation. I'll hand it back to Mindy. Thank you very much, Ian and Richard, for an enormously clear 
presentation, I must say it uh, it brings the consultation to life uh, for for me, <laughs> having even been part of this for so many weeks and months. Uh, it it is great to hear it explained in such a clear way. Uh, Richard, you 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 can turn your camera back on uh, for the for the panel session. Uh, thanks very much to all the attendees for putting questions in the Q and A function. Uh, as said before, we we have some time. Uh, to go through them, but maybe not as much as we had with other webinars. Um, the first question, perhaps to Sheila, and welcome, and thank you very much for participating. You're, uh, you're our rare disease expert, so perhaps we should start with a question that focuses on that area. So what do these modifiers mean for rare diseases? We saw Richard present some of this in, in one of his slides, but can you elaborate a little bit? Um, thanks, Minder, uh, and thanks for the invite to attend the webinar. I think for rare diseases, this is a massive step uh, towards uh, the recognition that some rare diseases have felt has been missing uh, in terms of the standard technology appraisals approach. So I think the proposal provides some really important benefits for rare diseases. Um, Although we found that there was no real evidence for the rarity modifier per se uh, to provide an extra weight, um, we have felt that most rare diseases are significantly severe uh, in line with the multiple comorbidities that are often associated with them. So we expect that a lot of the rare diseases that we may look at in the Standard Technologies Appraisals Programme will have the opportunity for these modifiers to be applied uh, and, and uh, understood better uh, by the company and by uh, stakeholders who are using them. The modifiers uh, obviously sit in a wider package of the methods improvements that will benefit rare diseases as a whole including things like the approach to uncertainty, where we're looking for greater flexibility that can be shown in terms of evidence generation, where it's often challenging in rare diseases to generate the evidence uh, base uh, in the context of other prevalent, more prevalent conditions. Um, and then we think uh, being able to continue to support the broader evidence base that can help address those key challenges that rare disease have, such as real world evidence, qualitative evidence, all of those things combined provide a much better platform for rare diseases to be given the flexibilities and the approaches that are needed uh, in the kind of entirety of the methods. So I think there's a real opportunity here for rare diseases to get some helpful support in navigating the path uh, through STA. Thanks, thanks very much, Ed, Sheila, that's, that's very clear. Just taking some, some questions also from the audience, there, uh, the, the first one, and this going back to the very beginning of what we said, how do we define society when we think about the preferences that we're trying to express? Is it users of the healthcare system, taxpayers? Uh, the, 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 the attendee says, whilst cost burden the healthcare system, values are gained by patients of an individual condition. So how do we, who do, whose values do we reflect when we make these proposals, Ian? Yeah, thank you. Um, this is something that's really important to debate, isn't it? And it's something that we know that is really important across all of what NICE, is, NICE, NICE does, because we, we operate um, for the benefit of, of the NHS and for, for, the, for the society as a whole. Um, and I think the, the question around how we define society, there's a number of different aspects to it. So in some, in some one aspect of this question would be where would we get the evidence from um, for, for societal value? And much of the evidence comes from things like uh, surveys and, and um, choice experiments and things like that. Some of the evidence that we've seen already. Um, and Richard also referred to evidence that we want to explore as well, new evidence that we yep. want to generate. And our objective there would be to make sure we really interrogate exactly this question of what do we mean by society and how can we go about capturing that view? I think some of the, the points the question raises around um, the impact on the healthcare system and patients, I wouldn't necessarily make that separation in quite that same way because we know that although a, a cost burden does impact on the healthcare system, it does then by extension impact on, impact on people 
uh, and other users of the health service um, um, because their care can be displaced. And we see this also in um, EQ5D that, again, raised by the, in the question, that we look at how society values or how people value particular health states looking at the general population. So I think there's an important need for us to take quite a wide view of this and not, uh, we wouldn't necessarily focus on individuals or specific patients, but look at the general population or as society. And that's why we use this rather broad, undefined term. But as I say, a really critical thing for us to do as we explore further research is to really interrogate that question uh, further and make sure we are getting the right view of the right people in representative ways. And of course, we're doing more work, aren't we, in this area through our Nice Listens uh, 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 initiative. Again, another question about the, the, kind of the beginning of, our, of your presentation. When we talked about uncertainty, you mentioned uh, uh, innovative treatments. Ian, how, how do we define innovative treatments? Again, that's something that's been really important across a number of different um, uh, areas, a number of different occasions. Um, so there is, there is some description of how we uh, refer to, to innovative treatments in the current methods guidance uh, around um, step changes in health in in healthcare, um, and that's something we haven't really proposed to make changes around um, and the objective particularly with the uncertainty modifier which is where this comes in so it comes in through the ability to uh, provide flexibility for the uncertain evidence in the case of innovative treatments we deliberately don't go too far in defining that because what we want is a set of methods that are future proof and are flexible for our committees to apply their expert judgment which they've been doing so successfully for so long um, and to I allow them the space to identify where something is innovative and that innovative nature is impacting on its ability or the, the ability of the company or uh, the, the trialists to get that high quality evidence. So it's, it's, it's difficult to get the, uh, the, the level of evidence that we might otherwise want to see because of that innovative nature. There's some aspect of that innovation um, whether it's a new disease area with, with limited evidence on the natural history or it's a, uh, a, new, type of, um, a new type of medicine uh, that hasn't yet got the, the backing that other types of medicine has. So to use that flexibility to identify why and where that innovation is causing that, um, uh, the uncertainty to arise and therefore to allow them to apply a flexibility um, so as to not be a barrier to our innovation, but also be proportionate and make sure we are preventing harms to, to people having the treatment or elsewhere in the health service. Great, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I think about the severity modifier, there's quite a lot of people asking questions, Richard, about why we're not using discounted a healthy lifetime quality. So why, why are we using, or why are we using discounted? Sorry, why are we not using undiscounted? Because other countries uh, seem to approach it that way. Well, at, in this stage, we we looked at the evidence that we had available and what we had available was the, uh, the discounted qualities. Mm -hmm. And to calculate the undiscounted qualities, I think um, would have introduced um, a, a bit more work to the to the uh, uh, to building the the modifier. So at at this stage, it was basically based on what event, evidence was available. That said, um, it, it is possible to to envisage a, a severity modifier that uses undiscounted. But um, it, it it there there's um, I guess that's that's an idea for future work where we can go back and recalculate all the different um, dis the, the undiscounted qualities for, for the previous topics. If I could just add to that, I think just to add, I think as well as the, the pragmatic approach, there is mm -hmm. a sort of normative basis for that. And it's really very much that um, the principle of discounting is common. So the, the rationale for, for using discounted qualities in a, in, a, in a severity measure is very much the same as the rationale for using discounting anywhere. That we consider that 
um, there is a, a, a time preference. So for, for people who uh, might not be quite so familiar with discounting, this reflects the idea that people would prefer to have benefits now than, than later. So, and I think that applies a, across the board within our evaluations. Um, and it also applies if a health technology had a particular harm. So that would also be, th those qualities would also be discounted. And by that same token, we would then suggest that the harms of a condition, the, the impact of that condition on people's health in the future mm -hmm. would also be subject to that, that time preference. Um, so th there's, a, there's a sort of an, a normative underpinning, so notwithstanding how, how other countries have chosen to approach this, that's the sort of the reasoning behind um, uh, why, why we've chosen to take that on, um, take, take that approach. Um, but again, um, in common with all of these proposals, this is something that we are presenting for consultation. We're very happy to, to hear if others have views, uh, di different views or consider that a different approach should be taken. Very helpful, both, both Ian and Richard. Some people ask who, who are supposed to provide the quality shortfalls? Is it, is it companies? Uh, is there other evidence that people can put to us to show the, the, the severity of a disease? So, as I said in the presentation, um, the idea of, of, of making this something that uh, companies and uh, stakeholders can engage in early on mm -hmm. is, is something that, that we would expect. And so we would expect companies to provide the information, but it, in, in conjunction with patient groups and, um, and, and other stakeholders that, that have a view on whether a disease is, is severe. Uh, and, and that would then be, um, as, as usual, um, reviewed by the external review groups and then that then considered by the, the committees. So, so that's how we anticipate that, that uh, it would probably be taken into account. Yeah, there, 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 there are several questions, Sheila, uh, about highly specialized technologies. And, and Richard was very clear that, that, that when it comes to the severity modifier, we're focusing very much on technology evaluations in, in, in the technology appraisal program. But rare diseases fit in both uh, uh, TA and HST. Uh, so we're talking here, when you talked about rare disease, we're talking really only about the technology evaluation, the technology appraisal program. Correct, correct. That's good. That's good to, <laughs> to have clarified. Um, when there's, I think Ian, you mentioned early on in your uh, section about research that we're doing in in, in the area of a societal value for severity. And there, there's some people asking about when that might be available, but there's also people asking why, why are we proposing something now when we could wait for that evidence? So is there a specific reason why we are moving from end of life to severity, even if the research evidence is still very much is being developed? But what is, the, what is the basis for that change at this stage? Yeah, absolutely. So to the latter point, why are we doing it now? Well, we have got good evidence that um, there is societal value as a, that we as a we as a country do value the benefits of health technologies, uh, health benefits that arise in particularly severe conditions more so than those in, in less severe conditions. So there is good evidence that that's the case. Uh, and that underpinned our first stage consultation. And that was, was quite well received, I think, in the consultation. It was supported by a, uh, a wide range of, of different groups and organizations and perspectives, which was really helpful uh, to see that support. And so we think on the basis of that evidence and that support, that there is a strong case to introduce uh, the modifier and to do it soon because the existing methods we know are not as, as well supported by evidence, the end of life uh, modifier, while in practice it was ca capturing a lot of very severe conditions, because we know that by, by definition, most end of life conditions are severe. So it's capturing a lot of those, but it, it's, not, it's nowhere near as well supported by evidence as a severity modifier. So that means that it's important to make a change now. What's missing is the evidence of how much. So we've got a, a good case to introduce a modifier. We don't quite know exactly how much, but we can introduce it now um, in a way that is at a similar level to the end of life uh, modifier, which has been broadly accepted 
um, uh, across the community for, for the years that it's been operating. So knowing that's um, uh, operating effectively uh, within the NHS, we think that's a reasonable starting point. So as to lay the groundwork to do better evaluations while we can continue that research. And in answer to the first question around the time frame, and the, re the real reason we need to do it now is because that time frame is likely to be rather long. It's quite a big piece of work. Mm -hmm. It will take some time to get really good quality evidence on, um, on, on how society values uh, so severe, severe conditions or, or benefits and severe conditions. The, that question earlier, that really great question earlier about uh, what do you mean by society? That's going to take a little bit of bottoming out, isn't it? Uh, as we <laughs> described. Um, so we need, we'll take some time on that. And what we're planning to do is articulate over the coming months what that looks like. We don't yet have a time frame uh, other than to say quite a long time. Um, so uh, quite a, a, a number of months or potentially even years. Um, we don't have an exact time frame yet, but we will be articulating over the coming months what that looks like and how it's likely to, to shape up. There, there, there's, there was a question, specific question about uh, uh, Richard about the proposals from 2014 when we came with with value-based assessment. Is there are these proposals very different? Uh, the way we're positioning them, the the way we're laying them out. Um, I mean, I think um, they're they are different, um, and certainly they're more fleshed out than they were in 2014. Um, and a, a lot more input has uh, been been taken uh, from external uh, stakeholders. Um, so, so yeah, I would I would say that, are, are they? Um, I, I think they're also different in the in substance as well. Um, so, so um, yeah, I, I, this is this is it's not a complete change, but it's it's an evolution of of what was proposed back then. That's a really good point, Rich. I think for me, one of the really key ways that this is a development from the 2014 is the proposal to use both absolute and proportional shortfall within one modifier reflecting different aspects of that same thing, whereas the, the value-based assessment approach te tended to look at them a little bit separately. And what we have here is that we are articulating a little bit more clearly exactly what we uh, mean by that and why it's beneficial to use both in in one go um, one of the reasons being that they can each account for others the, the shortcomings of the others or the limitations of the others so where absolute shortfall is strong in a particular type of condition proportional sh shortfall is particularly relevant in another type of condition and we can use those both together to build that full picture within that more defined uh, more evolved modifier and I think it's safe to say that we're the first um, organization that's proposing this combination of, um, of absolute and proportional shortfall to reflect severity. There's a number of questions which may be difficult to answer at this stage, but that talk about that, of course, we're, we're anchoring our work on the quality paradigm. So there's, you know, there's always methodological limitations in it uh, by, by definition. And how, do we, how do we think about that? Uh, Ian, is is this, or is it a pragmatic, as I as I would put it, a pragmatic uh, solution to something that we weren't particularly uh, supporting the end of life concept to now a more pragmatic and evidence based concept of severity, but but still using our basic quality paradigm. Yes, it is pragmatic. Um, it also has a number of strengths. So while there are some documented limitations and challenges of qualities, uh, they. Do have real strengths and um, they are this uh, uh, really helpful common currency of health across conditions so that's notwithstanding that they do have some limitations but they also have important strengths um, it is it's pragmatic but it's also consistent so we build a, a consistent picture that operates in the same way that we we already do and that is we are working effectively but the thing that's also worth stressing is that as with everything that NICE does, uh, particularly in these, these evaluations, particularly where we see complexities arising, rare diseases and highly specialized technologies and challenging technology appraisals, there is the flexibility of our expert committees and our independent committees. So they can look at the, the, the quality evidence, the quality shortfall in this case, or the quality gains in the case of particular treatment in the context of what they're hearing from 
from patient groups, from patients, from experts, from stakeholders to put, really put color to that. And I think that's one of the really uh, beneficial ways that patient groups uh, particularly could, could really help us uh, in our evaluations when we're using um, quality shortfalls to put some color to the, you know, the, the, the black, white or gray um, numbers, to put some color to that, to put some meaning to that, to allow our committees to, to use their judgments and to make the, the right decisions uh, for, for each individual evaluation. Thanks very much. We only have a couple of minutes left. There's, there's a number of questions which you could say are more practical, so I'm not going to go through all of those. I wanted to return to the to the research uh, we're proposing, and, and, and there's a question specifically about that. Are we going to work with other stakeholders in that research? And what are our ideas about the research? I think it's fair to say, Ian and Rich, that, that we're very much at the start of the thinking of what, we're, what we can do. Uh, uh, and, and we, of course, will be much, much welcome uh, uh, stakeholder contributions in that research. Uh, but we have, I don't think we have a, a specific set of plans there yet. Yeah, those plans are still being worked out. But uh, I think there, there's an absolute expectation that external stakeholders will be involved and that it won't be a black box uh, <laughs> when, when you get the final result. It, it, everybody will be... Uh, as involved as, as we can get them to be. Indeed, if there's one thing that we do know about the research is that we will involve, involve as many people as we possibly can. <laughs> that is brilliant. That's a, that's a great end to this, to this webinar, uh, Ian, Richard and Sheila. Uh, it's been so informative to, to, to hear you talk about what are really complex proposals, as we said at the beginning. Uh, we, we very much encourage everybody to continue to participate in the consultation. And we've got a, a final slide that shows uh, where you can share your views. They're on uh, uh, www.nice.org.uk slash methods dash review. The consultation closes on the 13th of October, 2021. I am sorry, we haven't been able to address every single question. Many of those were very interesting and we'll take them into account when we develop our response to the consultation. Uh, but thanks very much for dialing in. You can see this all again on YouTube uh, uh, when it is uploaded there later later uh, this week. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good afternoon. Uh, thanks, thanks to the team here at NICE for their support. Thank you, Mike.